This passage that we're going to be looking at is found in Acts 17. This is where Paul preaches among the intellectual elite of Athens, one of the classic examples of New Testament gospel preaching. Here we see the apostolic evangelistic strategy in action. It's an especially helpful example of how to confront false religion, philosophy, and to how to take on elitism in an evangelistic setting. And it, it, it takes place really in a highbrow academic environment, one of the best known portions of the book of Acts, Paul on Mars Hill. But this is also one of the most abused sections of all of Scripture. It's a favorite passage today for people who are trying to fashion a postmodern version of Christianity. And while you're turning to Acts 17, I want to point out that virtually every plenary speaker so far this week has used the word contextualization. And no less than a dozen times in the past couple of days, people have asked me to define what that word actually means. It's become one of the it's become part of the common jargon of late 20th century evangelicalism. It's one of those fad words like missional that we hear over and over again. But like most catchphrases and fad words, those terms sometimes seem like they don't quite mean the same thing to any two people. And also, like a lot of evangelical jargon, those words are used sometimes to cover a multitude of sins. You know, all of a sudden you can say or do the most crass, worldly, and even profane things, even from the pulpit, and justify it by saying, I'm just being missional. And you can wear all the badges and speak all the vulgar language of sec secular culture's dark side, and then you can vindicate your profanity by insisting all you're doing is contextualizing the gospel for subcultures who act and speak like that as a way of life. And the goal, they say, is to make Christianity seem more familiar and more comfortable and less countercultural to the people whom we're trying to reach. That's contextualization. It's a word and a concept that first sort of gained traction among evangelicals in the realm of Bible translation. Because obviously, if you're going to take the Word of God to a culture like, say, Eskimos, where they have no clue what sheep are, you have to find a way to explain all the pastoral images and, and references in terms that Eskimos can understand. Something like Psalm 100, verse 3, we are his people and the sheep of his pasture is obviously harder for an Eskimo to relate to than it would be for a New Zealander. Thank you for that. And so I actually read about one instance where uh, a group of Bible translators who were making a Bible for a unique Eskimo language translated the word sheep as sea lions. Everywhere you find it in the Bible. And I'm not, I, I can't imagine what that does to the 23rd Psalm. And I also can't imagine why it wouldn't be a whole lot easier just to teach Eskimos what sheep are, but there you have it. That is contextualization. And that's the sense in which Bible translators began to sort of use the term. I suppose you could say it's a kind of dynamic equivalence run amok. And so, it, it, actually, if you want a formal definition of contextualization, it's the practice of altering either the terminology or the content of our message in order to employ the language, the cultural tokens, the styles, the values, the preoccupations of the culture or subculture we're trying to reach. Now, obviously, there is a legitimate sense in which it's absolutely essential to translate the gospel into the language of the country or people group we want to reach. The Apostle Paul himself said, to the Jews I became as a Jew that I might win Jews, to those who are without law as without law. But, he added, not being without law towards God, that's the phrase I think a lot of contextualizers miss, he said, to the weak I become as weak that I might win the weak, I have become all things to all men that I might by all means save some, 1 Corinthians 9, 20 and 21. 
Now understand, Paul was talking there not merely about speaking the language, but also about observing the formal customs of differing cultures. Why? In order to keep from making himself a bigger stumbling block than the gospel already is. You know, you won't find it very easy to evangelize Hasidic Jews if your strategy is inviting them over to your home and serving ham casseroles. That's obvious, right? There is an obvious sense in which it is right and good and necessary to avoid the cultural taboos of whatever people group you're trying to minister to. That's what Paul was talking about. But when you hear people today who are enthralled with the idea of contextualization, they usually turn that principle on its head. And rather than avoiding cultural taboos in order to not obscure the gospel unnecessarily, they are trying purposely to flout as many taboos as possible. Unlike Paul, who wanted to avoid anything that was considered impolite or uncouth so that the gospel could be heard without unnecessary distractions, the contextualizers of today want, actually want to maximize the shock and awe effect, thinking that's going to gain them a better hearing with the South Park generation. And they also usually go far beyond adopting just the language and the social conventions of polite culture. You know, things like bowing and showing deference in the proper places. And instead, they, they try to adapt the content of the gospel message itself as much as possible to the worldview of whatever subculture they see as their target audience. That is what contextualization has come to mean, adapting to the worldview, the target worldview, so that not only do sea lions become an acceptable substitute for sheep, postmodern tolerance becomes an acceptable replacement for Christian charity. One advocate of contextualization defines the term this way. He says it means, quote, temporarily adopting whatever worldview is held by the people we're trying to reach so that we can speak to them as one of them and not as outsiders and aliens. That's his definition. And in practice, that idea has dramatically changed the evangelistic strategy so that the number one goal in contemporary evangelical outreach is for the church to assimilate into the world as much as possible and above all, be cool so that the world will like us. And if they like us, the rationale goes, they'll accept our Jesus. That is actually the driving idea behind both seeker-sensitive ministry and the emerging church approach. The idea of contextualization by adjusting Christianity as much as possible to existing beliefs and traditions, that was probably the 20th century's most significant contribution to missionary strategy, and it's not a good one. It has made the church indistinguishable from the world. It has made us indistinct in our message. It's made us, frankly, ineffectual as an evangelistic force in an unbelieving culture. And in the last decade or so, this passion for contextualizing everything has shown no restraint whatsoever. That's why you read so many newspaper articles nowadays about churches that meet in bars and men's ministries that feature poker games and churches where the main place for the corporate gathering is outfitted with comfy sofas where people can sit and talk to one another instead of pews where they can sit and listen to a preacher. One website promoting contextualization quotes Ernest Hemingway as the, the guru of, of this. He says, bait the hook according to what the fish likes, not what the fisherman likes. And that webpage goes on to say that this is the key to all effective missional ministry. Quote, you have to be what they are looking for, unquote. Now that plays out in various ways. You have some people who think in order to reach a generation weaned on ultimate fighting and MTV, you have to live and breathe and speak that language with all its profanity and vulgarity and sexual innuendo. Be loud and proud with it, you know? And if you don't frame the gospel in that kind of context, they will insist you simply cannot reach postmoderns. And another approach to contextualization has taken practically the opposite direction, saying that if you really want to reach 
postmodernized cultures and subcultures, you cannot preach anything with strong convictions. Certainty is offensive to postmodern sensibilities, and firm doctrinal positions are perceived as arrogant, and traditional approaches to Christianity are hopelessly uncool, and so, in the words of Brian McLaren, everything must change. We'll get further to peop with people today if we listen to them rather than preaching to them. And that is all supposed to sound very friendly and affable and humble and gracious, but you know what? It's not. It's really arrogant and uncharitable, and it's a rebellion against the truth. Here's a good rule of thumb. Anytime you encounter someone whose ministry philosophy is more concerned with style and methodology than with truth and clarity, steer clear. It's troubling today that the gospel has been relegated to the back of the shelf, or in some cases the gospel message has been done away with altogether in the name of being missional. The gospel ought to be front and center in everything. But instead, postmodern strategists have practically all but set aside the content of the Christian message, and they are obsessed instead with things like culture, contextualization, conversation, and charitableness. In fact, those are the chief tools for reaching under, uh, unbelievers today, not the gospel itself. Read all the books, that's what you'll find. And often you will hear people trying to justify these style-driven strategies by singling out this famous account of how Paul ministered among the elite philosophers of Athens. You know, he blended into their culture, they say. He contextualized his message by speaking in the language and the style of his hearers. He observed their religion and he learned from their beliefs before he tried to teach them. And he didn't step on their toes by refuting what they believed, but instead he took their idea of the unknown God and embraced that and used that as the starting point for his message about Christ. And right there you have all the major elements of postmodern missional ministry, culture, contextualization, conversation, and charitableness. Now, I think you're going to see as we look what this passage really says, and as we look into it more carefully, that Paul used none of those strategies, at least not in the way they have been defined and packaged by most of today's postmodern emergent and missional church leaders. But in reality, Paul was bold and plain-spoken. He was countercultural. He was confrontive. He was confident, and by Athenian standards, much less today's standards, he was closed-minded. He offended a significant number of Athens' intellectual elite, and he walked away from that encounter without winning the admiration of society at large, but with just a small group of converts who followed him. But you know what? That is the biblical approach to ministry. You don't measure its success or failure by how pleased the crowd is at the end of the meeting. Our first concern is clarity and the power with which the message is delivered. The right question to ask is not how many people receive the message warmly. It's nice if they do, but that's usually not the majority response. The right question to ask is whether the signs of conviction are seen in those who have heard. And sometimes a forceful negative reaction is the result of the gospel's convicting aspects, and in fact, when unbelievers walk away without repenting of their sin, without embracing Christ, the truth is an overtly hostile reaction is a better indication that the right message was delivered than a round of applause and an outpouring of good feeling from the crowd. You don't want a crowd of appreciative worldlings to tell you they loved your message. We need to remember that. We're tempted to think that when people reject the gospel, it's because we've done a poor job of presenting it. And sometimes that's true, but it's not necessarily true. And that's not even our concern. The proper focus for us is to be as clear and as accurate as possible, not to be a stumbling block that keeps people from hearing the gospel, but the gospel itself is 
is a stumbling block for unbelievers, and so people will stumble and even get angry when they are presented with it. And we have no right to try to reshape the gospel so that it's no longer a stumbling block. You can't proclaim the gospel faithfully if your goal is for no one ever to be offended by it. That's a hard lesson for a lot of people today to learn, but it's true. We could learn a lot from what Jesus did in John 6. That chapter begins with this verse, verse 2. Then a great multitude followed him because they saw his signs which he performed on those who were diseased. See, they liked it when he did miracles, but they didn't want his message. And in John 6, he preached the message to them anyway. And at the end of that chapter, John writes this, verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. And then while that crowd was diminishing to almost nothing, verse 67, John says, Jesus turned to the twelve and said, Do you also want to go away? And verse 70, Did I not choose you, the twelve, and one of you is a devil? See, in the face of a mass exodus of his disciples, Jesus was not concerned about doing what he could to seem more likable. He actually pressed the message with more clarity and more candor than ever. And that is exactly what Paul does here in Acts 17. His strategy is actually about as far as possible from the postmodernized approach that drives so much of the contemporary evangelical church's outreach efforts. So let's just start with that simple list of postmodern terms, those, those tools from the postmodernist toolbox. The, the favorite tools of missional ministry today, culture, contextualization, conversation, and charitableness, and let's use those four words as our outline to sort of work through a survey of Paul's sermon here. And if you didn't get all four, don't worry, I'll repeat them as we move from point to point. First is culture. See what Paul did with this. And this will take a minute to cover because we need to go back to at least verse 13 of Acts 17 to understand the context of this incident in Athens. Paul started this by ministering in Berea, where he had gone under cover of night, verse 10, after his ministry in Thessalonica had stirred up so much civil unrest that he couldn't possibly minister there publicly without the threat of a riot. And Berea, if you look at a map, it's about 40 miles inland from Thessalonica, not on a major trade route. So the plan might have been to go where they could preach the gospel without quite so much of that deliberate public opposition from the Jewish leaders. But when Paul went to Berea, he didn't lay low or hide out or try to minister quietly through just, you know, private discipleship lessons so nobody would get upset. He started proclaiming the gospel in the synagogue and in the public square there also. Luke says, verse 13, when the Jews came from Thessalonica and learned that the word of God was preached by Paul at Berea, they came there also and stirred up the crowds. Then immediately the brethren sent Paul away to go to the sea, but both Silas and Timothy remained there. So what Luke is saying here is that Paul's missionary team spirited him away into hiding, now for the second time. He was clearly not winning general admiration and grassroots popularity in the cultures where he was taking the gospel. People kept trying to kill him. And Paul couldn't go back to Thessalonica or Berea now because his enemies in those cities were so determined to disrupt any ministry he did. So, verse 15, those who conducted Paul brought him to Athens. And receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him with all speed, they departed. Now, I presume he went by ship. If you look at a map, that's the, the fastest way to go, the easiest, safest, and most reasonable place, way to travel from the Greek coast near Berea to Athens. So here's the scenario. Paul is cut off from his missionary team, and he is sent alone to Athens for his own safety. Now, from Berea and Thessalonica to Athens is about four days' travel by land and two or three days by sea, depending on the wind and the tides. So he has to send messengers back to his team, and, and then they have to come 
If you do the math on it, he probably has about a two-week wait in Athens alone before they can join him there, and he spends that time in Athens investigating the city and its culture. But he simultaneously launches his public ministry in Athens, again, both at the synagogue there and in the public square, verses 16 and 8 through 18. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Therefore, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered them, him, and some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. Now, what's crucial to notice here, first of all, is Paul's relationship to the culture. He doesn't try to assimilate. He doesn't embrace the culture and look for ways to shape the gospel to suit it. He is repulsed by it. Look at verse 16 again. His spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. And the English really doesn't do full justice to the power of this expression. The Greek word for provoked is paroxuno which is a very intense word, meaning he was exasperated or agitated. It conveys the idea of extreme outrage and indignation. He was so upset he couldn't contain it. Now, Paul obviously was well-educated, and he was fully aware of the history and the details of Greek mythology and the religion of Athens. This didn't come as a surprise to them. He had even memorized sections from passages from Greek poets and writers. We're going to see that in this chapter. But this was his first time personally to be in Athens and to see all these temples with his own eyes and to witness that omnipresent idolatry for himself. And wherever he looked, he saw the signs of it, sophisticated, intellectual, completely unspiritual religion that was utterly without any reference to the true God. And that was the defining mark of that culture. It grieved Paul de deeply. And so he immediately began confronting the idolatry by proclaiming Christ. Notice when Luke says in verse 17 that he reasoned with people in these public places, he's not suggesting that Paul had cream tea and quiet conversation with them. It means he stood somewhere where people couldn't possibly miss him, and he began to preach and proclaim like a herald, and then he interacted with hecklers and critics and honest inquirers alike. And Luke uses the, a Greek word, dialogomai, from, from which the English word dialogue is derived, but the Greek expression actually is a very strong one. It doesn't just mean dialogue, it includes that. It conveys the idea of a debate a verbal disputation. It can also speak of a sermon or a philosophical and polemical argument. I think Paul did all of that. He took on all comers. And in fact, in the King James Version, it says, he disputed in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with whoever met with him. Which is not to say that he was belligerent or pugnacious, but that he proclaimed the truth about Christ, and then he responded to whatever questions or arguments or objections people raised. In other words, he confronted their false beliefs. He did not try to accommodate them. Paul was deliberately and intentionally countercultural. He didn't say, oh, you know what, these people think the bodily resurrection is foolish, so I better low-key that part of the message. He did exactly the opposite. He studied that culture with an eye to confronting people with the very truths they were most prone to reject. And he wasn't winning any admiration from the intellectual elite for his cultural sensitivity either. Notice verse 18, certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him. And as we're going to see, they were not impressed. They called him a seed picker and more or less made sport of him. The Epicureans and the Stoics, these are interesting groups, they were two very influential and competing brands of Greek philosophy, two opposite ends of the philosophical pole. The Stoics were secular determinists. They believed the height of human enlightenment was achieved by utter indifference 
to either pleasure or pain. And when I say they were determinists, I mean they believed everything is foreordained, predestined, unchangeably by random chance. And therefore, they thought nothing really matters in the ultimate sense. Fatalists. You think of them as secular hyper-Calvinists with a dose of Greek mythology defining whatever theistic elements there were in their religion. And their goal was self-mastery through the overcoming of their own emotions. And they lived austere, simple lives. That they, they wanted to enjoy as few pleasures as possible because they wanted to be indifferent to pleasure or pain. This sect, the Stoics, was founded by Zeno. You've heard his name, I'm sure. About 300 years before Paul comes to Athens, 350 years, really, before Paul comes to Athens. So the, this whole system founded in about 300 B.C. was three and a half centuries old, and it was a mainstay of Greek philosophy when Paul encountered these guys. The Epicureans were at the opposite end of this philosophical spectrum. They believed the chief end of man was to enjoy pleasure and avoid pain. They obviously had a more popular system. <laughs> and they indulged in all the finest pleasures this life had to offer. Epicureanism was likewise about 350 years old, and one of the central ideas of the Epicurean philosophy was that God is not to be feared. They didn't believe in life after death, and so their one goal was earthly happiness. They were practically the opposite of the Stoics. Now, the Stoics and the Epicureans were obviously poles apart on the philosophical spectrum and adversarial in many of their beliefs, and there's no doubt that some of the most interesting debates between competing Greek philosophies pitted the Stoics against the Epicureans and vice versa. But they also shared some of their most fundamental beliefs in common, and one of those common beliefs... Well, actually, all of those common beliefs became the defining elements of Greek thought and culture. One of them was materialism. Both philosophies were materialistic. Both of them were man-centered. And therefore, they were united in their resistance to all biblical truth, which they had obviously encountered in Judaism. Now, there was a third major strain of Greek philosophy that's not named here by Luke, the cynics. And even though cynicism isn't specifically named by Luke, it is almost certain that there were cynics in this audience as well. You can tell that from the response Paul receives at the end. The cynics, here's something about their belief, they believe virtue is defined by nature and that true happiness is achieved by freeing oneself from unnatural values like wealth and fame and power. And, and, and if you really want to be happy, what you have to do is live in harmony with nature. They were like the original hippies. And in fact, they were known for their neglect of things like personal hygiene and accountability and family responsibilities and all that. You can imagine some of these guys, right? You probably have a few of them hanging around the periphery of your church. <laughs> Cynicism was actually the oldest of these three strains of philosophy. It dated back to about 400 years before Christ. So cynicism was also an ancient system, 450 years old by the time Paul stood in the Areopagus. But cynicism was still a robust system in Athens, and the cynics had a peculiar knack for irritating the other philosophers. So you got to kind of like them. <laughs> now remember, Paul was grieved by Athenian culture. It would be foolish to suggest that he embraced any of the defining spiritual elements of that culture. His message was countercultural and disturbing to the ears of Stoics, Epicureans, and Cynics alike. But some of these high-powered philosophers actually overheard him disputing in the marketplace, and they thought, hey, this guy would be an interesting person to have in a discussion with the elite minds of Athens. They could surely tell Paul was an educated man and not just some random crackpot, and yet, his ideas to them seemed so bizarre to their way of thinking that they, they just simply didn't have a way to categorize him in their systems. He was clearly neither Stoic nor Epicurean nor Cynic. He stood in opposition to all of them, and that was obvious because of what he preached, Jesus and the resurrection. 
And their attitude towards him is obvious in what they said. Some said, what does this babbler want to say? And they use a word here, actually the Greek word means seed picker, because I think they were comparing him to a chicken picking up, you know, a seed here and there as if to say, okay, he has a cogent thought now and then, but it's also mixed with these strange notions about the resurrection, and, and we wonder where he picked up the knowledge that he does have. It's like a seed-picking bird, you know, pecking and swallowing here and there, but not really very sophisticated. He was clearly out of step with every major system of human wisdom known at that time, countercultural. And that's what they meant by a proclaimer of foreign gods. Here's a prophet of some new and unconventional countercultural religion. But Paul was still articulate enough to catch their attention. And at least, best of all, he was a novelty. And that, according to verse 21, was something they loved. For all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Boy, does that sound like our culture, huh? See, Athens was the place to serve the ancient, surf the ancient web, you know, and see what's new. And Paul was like the latest viral YouTube video. <laughs> and so, verse 19, they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, may we know what is this strange doctrine of which you speak, for you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. Now, that finally gets us to the actual passage I want to survey, which is Paul's sermon. He is brought to the Areopagus, which in the King James says Mars Hill, named for that hill, uh, which was the place where these philosophers or their ancestors had started meeting centuries before. By Paul's time, the Areopagus was probably some great hall somewhere where they all met. And, and in fact, the word Areopagus was a reference to the group of men, not the place where they met. But Paul goes there. Here he is, surrounded by the most high-powered minds of the most intellectual city in the world, and he has an opportunity to speak to them, and this is what he said, verse 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. Now, here is where many people today would say Paul adapted to and embraced their culture rather than being confrontive or antagonistic because he begins with a reference to their beliefs and especially the religious culture of the city, and he makes that the point of contact. But now, remember, we have to read this in light of its context, and verse 16 says, that was the very aspect of Athenian culture that most grieved Paul. In other words, he homed in on the one point of culture that most disturbed him, and he began there, because that is what he most wanted to challenge. That was the main lie he wanted to answer with the truth, and he made a beeline for it. You are very religious, he says. I can see it everywhere. But you know what? The truth is they weren't religious at all. They had all the trappings of religion with temples and idols everywhere, but their ancient religions were nothing but superstition run amok. And all of that had long ago in Greek society just sort of morphed into a simple love of human wisdom. That is what they worshipped, human wisdom. 1 Corinthians 1.22, the Greeks seek after wisdom. Philosophy was the only god they served. The Epicureans didn't even believe in an afterlife, and the Stoics were materialists whose God was an amorphous and utterly impersonal notion of nature. The Cynics had also deified nature. In other words, all the major strains of Greek philosophy were fundamentally materialistic. They had fashioned a kind of quasi-spirituality that was in fact not spiritual at all. None of them believed in a personal God. None of them had any higher value than human wisdom. Their ethics were naturalistic and materialistic. They were all practical atheists, in many ways a mirror of our society today. 
In fact, it's really striking how the worldly wisdom of that day was not vastly different from what supposedly enlightened people believe today. They weren't religious at all. And Paul here is clearly using sanctified sarcasm when he starts out by observing how religious they were. Now, their culture, like ours, had all the trappings of religion, and they were omnipresent. You had temples on every corner. You had idols, priests, and priestesses, lots of superstitions, lots of deeply ingrained traditions, but they were all almost entirely devoid of any kind of true faith. That's, that stuff just saturated all of society. It had the very same significance as all those massive cathedrals in Europe today, or all the church buildings you'd see if you drove through New England today. But the people aren't really religious. And in the tradition of their polytheistic mythology, they, they kind of deified everything, at least in the language they used. They didn't believe in any real deities, but they, had, they spoke about the god of war, Ares, the sun god, Apollo, Hades, the lord of the underworld, Hermes, the messenger god, Poseidon, the god of the sea, and Zeus, the king of the gods. And there were also other gods. Those were just the Olympian gods. There were the primordial gods, including Ether, the god of the atmosphere, and Kronos, the god of time, Eros, the god of love, Erebus, the god of shadow, and many, many more. And then there were the Titans, a lower level of gods, and the nymphs, and the giants, and hundreds of lesser gods. And of course, no educated person in all of Athens really believed any of those gods were real, but they were just part of the culture's mythology. And when they ran out of things to deify, someone decided to erect a monument to whatever god there might be who was overlooked by the Greek system, just so that no deity was inadvertently slighted. And so they had this altar to the unknown god, kind of like our tomb of the unknown soldier, just in case they overlooked giving honor to a hidden deity somewhere. So they had an altar that just kind of covered all the bases for them. And Paul had seen that altar, and he seized on that for the opening of his message. Now, you have to understand, this was by no means an affirmation of their culture. It was just the opposite. This was Paul's way of homing in on what was spiritually most odious about the culture. In this quasi-religious, deeply superstitious, man-centered, materialistic, intellectual culture, here was an altar to something unknown. The irony was rich because what they really worshipped was human wisdom and knowledge. But here was an altar to something they were admittedly ignorant about. And Paul more or less rubs salt in that wound. He places the accent on their utter ignorance of the one thing that matters most. This God whom you are utterly ignorant about, that's the God whose name I want to declare to you. Don't miss what Paul was doing here. He wasn't shoehorning God into an open niche in Greek mythology. He wasn't affirming their beliefs or embracing this aspect of their culture at all. He was seizing on this one supremely important point where they admitted their own ignorance and he was using that as a foot in the door so he could proclaim to them the gospel. As far as the religious aspect of their culture was concerned, he stood against it. And this opening statement made that fact absolutely clear to them. He could not possibly have been more countercultural. It was as if someone got into the midst of a bunch of academic postmodernists today and declared that the Bible is true. Just imagine an auditorium full of postmodernist college professors, you know, wringing their hands about epistemological humility and the dangers of overconfidence and the uncertainty of human knowledge and the subjectivity of all our opinions and the whole dose of postmodern angst about being sure about anything. And suppose you stood up in front of that group with a Bible and declared, Here's something you can be rock-solid certain about, because God himself revealed it as absolute truth. That's what this was like, countercultural. 
So I hope you see here, Paul is not using culture as a kind of pragmatic or ecumenical evangelistic tool in order to get himself into their inner circle and become a part of their group in order to win them. He stands in their midst as an alien to their culture, and in his own words, he proclaimed the truth about God to them. So that's the first tool of postmodern ministry, culture. Here's another one, conversation. Conversation. Notice again, Paul is simply declaring the truth here. He's not sponsoring a colloquium about it. He had already provoked discussions and debates about the gospel in the synagogue and in the marketplace, but look, now that he had his foot in the door and an audience with the Areopagites, he doesn't say, hey, let's talk about this. You know, I'm interested in learning more about your approach to the spiritual disciplines and your ideas about ethics, and tell me what you guys think about the God of Abraham, and maybe we can learn from one another. No. Again, he homes in on the very heart of what he wants them to know. He is preaching here, not inviting a conversation. Verse 24, God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives all to all life, breath, and all things." And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. Now, what I, we'll look at the, at the words here, but what I want you to notice, first of all, is that this is a simple declaration of truth. This is not an offer to exchange ideas. He starts with the basic principles of theology proper. He declares that God is creator. God made the world and everything in it. That is the essential starting place of all biblical truth. And even though our society wants to weasel around on that point, and there are no end of Christians who are willing to mess around with it, Paul doesn't. He just declares God made the world and everything in it. That's the essential starting point. He affirms the authority of God. He is Lord of heaven and earth. He affirms the spirituality of God to these materialistic philosophers. He does not dwell in temples made with hands. And he affirms the sufficiency of God, his sovereignty, his transcendence, his imminence, and his power as the giver and sustainer of all life. It is a remarkable course in theology proper in a very brief economy of words. And all of it Every word of it was flatly contradictory to what these philosophers believed. But there's no give and take exchange of opinions. Paul doesn't act deferential in the presence of these great minds. He doesn't assume a false humility and pretend he's just a truth seeker on a spiritual journey and looking for companions on the way. He declares the truth of God to them and he does it with authority and conviction. He doesn't use the conventional style and subdued demeanor most people think we need to use so that people don't think we're arrogant. Paul wasn't arrogant because he was declaring infallible truth that God had revealed. It would have been arrogant for him to pretend he couldn't really be sure about it. He wasn't merely floating an opinion of his own for these philosophers to kick around. And he used an appropriate method, a sermon, not a conversation. Culture, conversation. Here's that third favorite tool of postmodern evangelism, contextualization. Paul didn't use that tactic either. Contextualization. Now, again, there is an obvious and legitimate need to speak a language people understand if you want to reach them. Paul didn't go into Athens and speak Hebrew to the Areopagites. He spoke in Greek. There's nothing the least bit remarkable about that. But notice what Paul did not do was adapt his message in any way to the basic values and belief systems of that culture. And that's what I mean when I say he shunned the tactic of... contextualization. Let's look at what he did do. Every dyed-in-the-wool contextualizer will point out that he quoted the philosophers' 
favorite poets right back at them. Verse 28. For in him we live and move and have our being, as some, also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. He is quoting there two well-known poets, Epimenides, who was a poet from the island of Crete in the 6th century B.C., 650 years before Paul. Epimenides wrote that line, in him we live and move and have our being. And Erotus, who was a Macedonian poet from the 3rd century B.C., 350 years before Paul, wrote this, we are also his offspring. Two lines from poets who, notice, were already ancient in Paul's time. Paul was not embracing aspects of the first century Greek worldview or culture. He was not affirming what was fashionable in the Greek academy of his own day, quite the opposite. He was quoting from their ancient literature to express his own worldview and show them that in a common grace sense, these are truths that were available to them also. They were there in black and white in their own ancient writings. And he was using those quotations from their literature, the literature of their forefathers, to confront the more contemporary and popular worldview of that generation. And as a matter of fact, what Paul is doing here is he's doing his utmost to demolish their worldview. And so he goes systematically through a list of ideas that they held in error, and he confronts them with true ideas instead. So there he stands in Athens amid countless temples and idols, talking to the culture's most enlightened minds, all of whom held worldviews that were, for all practical purposes, atheistic, materialistic, and superstitious all at once. Half of them believed in an afterlife, but it was a disembodied sort of quasi-spiritual notion of the afterlife. The other half were such hardened materialists that they believe when your body dies, the molecules go back to dust, and that's it. That was the Epicureans. The Stoics believed in a kind of quasi-spiritual afterlife. But they all believed there was no such thing as a human soul and thus no conscious existence after death. It was very much like our secularized atheistic culture today. So Paul is surrounded by these massive stone temples that were relics of a mostly discarded belief system when he has this to say, verse 29. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Wow. I mean, Paul could hardly have said anything more countercultural, more in conflict with the prevailing worldviews, less contextualized for these Athenian philosophers. And without trying to exegete his whole speech, let me just point out a handful of major points in this short message. Here are at least six points in the span of six verses that would have been deeply offensive to the Athenian philosophers. And, and just so you know, this was not ignorance on Paul's part. It was not an accident on his part. He knew enough about their beliefs to know that he was challenging their most precious presuppositions. He was attacking the building blocks of their entire worldview. For one thing, in verses 24 and 25, when he says, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since God himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. Paul was summarily dismissing there all the fundamentals of Greek-style religion. He knew what the Greek mythology taught, and the Athenian philosophers weren't naive about world religions either. It wasn't as if they were clueless about Judaism or the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Paul was not introducing them to a God they'd never heard of. He was simply telling them as plainly as possible that their beliefs were wrong. And he was declaring the truth about God, not in the philosophical style they were accustomed to, as if to make himself seem wise and enlightened, but he was preaching authoritative truth from God himself. 
And furthermore, he stressed that the God of Scripture is not just another character who belongs in the Greek pantheon. Notice, Paul insists that God is Lord of heaven and earth. He does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands. He is fully self-sufficient and sovereign over all. This was tantamount to a bold and wholesale dismissal of every aspect of Greek religion. And you can bet those Athenians got the point. And furthermore, when he said in verse 26 that God has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, he was attacking one of the common assumptions of the Athenian elite because they were convinced the Greek race was superior to every other strain of humanity. And they thought they were the elite of the elite because they had the best minds and the best race. And so when he says God made everybody out of one blood, he's stepping all over their belief system. When he said God has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings, he was emphatically affirming the sovereignty of the one true God to this bunch of materialistic determinists who believed in the sovereignty of blind mechanical chance. And in verse 27 where Paul says, God is not far from each one of us, and then he emphasizes that truth again in verse 28, he was declaring the imminence of God an idea that was completely and utterly ludicrous to these Athenian intellectuals who believed God was completely transcendent and therefore unknowable. God said, no, or or Paul says, no, he's imminent. He's close to us, not far from each one of us. And when in verse 29, he ridiculed the idea that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. And then in verse 30, he described that idea as the defining mark of these times of ignorance, you have to remember that he was talking to the one crowd in the entire world who were least likely to admit that anything they believed could properly be labeled ignorant. It begins to look like Paul was deliberately trying to provoke them. And in a true sense, he was. He caps the sermon in verse 30 with a demand for their repentance. And believe me, that was no less offensive on the Areopagus in the first century than it would be in the UN General Council today. (laughs) Paul could hardly have packed more hard truth and more countercultural commentary into those few words. Every sentence he had said something in it that would be offensive to those philosophers. Now, it should be obvious that in the sense postmodern evangelicals use these terms, Paul did not employ either culture, conversation, or contextualization as the primary tools for his strategy of evangelization. This is not how he was trying to reach Athens. What about the final item in the postmodernist toolbox? Charitableness. Charitableness. Now, let me be clear. When I speak of charitableness here, I'm not talking about the true biblical virtue of charity, which is defined in 1 Corinthians 13, which, by the way, rejoices in the truth, right? That's true charity. But instead, what I have in mind here is the postmodern notion of charitableness, which is kind of a broad-minded, altruistic, overly tolerant attitude where you refuse to take any dogmatic position on anything. You always leave open the possibility that someone else's truth is better than yours, you know? You never write off someone else's beliefs completely, and you always seek to be conciliatory. Look for common ground. Be full of goodwill towards the other person's worldview. Bottom line, you take the position that nothing we believe is really anything other than a personal opinion. That's charitableness. And that kind of charitableness also often uses appeasement rather than confrontation to try to win the other person's admiration. Did Paul do that here? Sounds pretty silly even to ask that question, doesn't it? You know he didn't do that. He simply proclaimed the message Christ had given him to preach, not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, 1 Corinthians 2.4. And notice 
Once again, he headed straight for the one truth he knew very well would sound like utter foolishness to these guys, the resurrection of the dead. Remember, these guys were all materialists. Even the ones who believed in a kind of afterlife thought the idea of heaven and hell as actual places where people have glorified bodies, that sounded so utterly foolish and unthinkable that when Paul got to that point in his message, it brought the house down. End of sermon, verse 32, and when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, while others said, we will hear you again on this matter. And so Paul departed from among them. However, some men joined him and believed, among them Dionysius the Areopagite, a woman named Damaris, and others with them. Notice, three reactions, and I think it's safe to assume Luke lists them in declining order from the majority response to the minority. Here they are, one, some mocked which is exactly what you would expect someone steeped in Greek philosophy to do because Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, which to the Greeks is foolishness, 1 Corinthians 1, 22 and 23. Paul's worldview was so utterly and completely in contrast with the Athenian culture and their belief system that most of these guys simply turned away, just what you would expect them to do. That doesn't mean Paul failed. Listen, if every last person in the philosopher's circle had turned away angry, that wouldn't have meant Paul's ministry strategy was wrong. Because his only task as an ambassador for Christ is to deliver the message clearly and accurately, to give the message you're supposed to give from the person who you're serving as ambassador. And Paul did that. And if they had picked up stones to kill him, the way the crowd did at Lystra in Acts 14, God would still have judged Paul faithful. But if he compromised the message in order to win people's appreciation rather than their repentance, that would not have been faithful. In this case, however, there were three responses. Some turned away and mocked. Others said, we will hear you again on this matter. Paul's straightforwardness evidently gained their interest in what he had to say. And so he had an open door to preach the gospel again to some of these people. And for a handful of people, response number three, people including, the names are given for us here, Dionysius the Areopagite, Areopagite which means this, was, this guy was one of these philosophers, a woman named Damaris, probably a, a bystander who was just interested in the dialogue, and others with them. For them, this was the moment of conversion. They believed and they became disciples. That is what faithful ministry looks like. It doesn't cower before the opposition. It isn't intimidated by human wisdom. It isn't shaken by rejection. It doesn't waver from the truth. It doesn't shift and change in its content to suit the preferences or the felt needs of the audience. It has one theme, and that is Christ in his death and resurrection. And it has one strategy, and that is to unpack the meaning of Christ's death and resurrection and proclaim it with clarity because that is the very substance, the only substance of the gospel message we have been commissioned to proclaim. And it confronts every worldview, every false religion, every superstitious belief, every human philosophy, and every skeptical opinion. And it rises above all those things and speaks with authority because it is the truth of God. Let's pray.